So we asked ourselves, what's changed? And here's what had changed. We got it intuitively when we stopped for long enough to reflect on this, that the marketplace was anxious. Then I went looking for evidence that it wasn't just Greg and the thought bubble. And what we got was that yes, the trust in our trust on the planet now in 2024 is at an all time low ebb. The marketplace remains anxious and the marketplace is made up of human beings. So what's the antidote to anxiousness was the question that we asked. And the answer to the antidote to anxiousness is... Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of More Clients, Less Effort. I am joined today by the amazing, 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 so amazing, you get it three times, if not a fourth time there, Greg Smith. Greg? G'day, mate. How are you? Good morning. I am doing not too bad. Still still trying to shake this this cold, but uh, that happens. That happens. You've been doing this business thing for a while, haven't you? I've been in business for, I don't know, round figures, 30 years. 30 years? It's a while. What do you think is the biggest lesson, was the biggest lesson you've learned over that time? But it's business people, entrepreneurs are good at making nothing into something. And that giving birth of nothing to something takes a whole bunch of life force and effort. It's challenging. Business ain't easy. Yeah. Wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Yes. Those are definitely <laughs> like that. Okay. Take me back, right? I know your first business, you were in the, you were in the outdoor education space mm -hmm. in time, 25 years as your first venture. And 25 years in any business, I think, is both a testament to getting at least a few things right, but also some perseverance. Take me back to when you started that and why you went, I guess, the road less traveled. <laughs> so the motivation came from my own discernment process as a younger adult, and I made a decision that I wanted to be involved in education, but I didn't want to be in a classroom. So I went looking for ways for me to have an impact and being outdoors was the way that I wanted to have that impact and make a difference because I'd had some of my formation experiences as a younger man had definitely been supported by me being outdoors and dealing with what comes with night and day and hot and cold and up and down and long and slow and all the rest of it. So blisters on your feet. Some... Yeah. So I stood in a paddock in 1992 in the northern rivers of New South Wales. It was a three and a half thousand acre paddock. And there was nothing there except a couple of drop toilets and showers, a couple of showers. And I'd been looking for this opportunity, not deliberately, but subconsciously, I'd been looking for this to present itself. And as I stood in that paddock with my wife, she looked at me and I looked at her and she said, it looks like we're moving from Melbourne. And I said, yep, I think we are. So we started the process from in 90, 1992, building that business, moved to the property in 1994, and we kept going. Started absolutely from scratch. Went into the forest, chopped the trees down, scun them, dragged them, put them in holes, built sheds, built kitchens, built toilet facilities, shower facilities, etc., etc. Brave. Do you regret that? Crazy. Yeah, but I've heard of what? And I just had a deal, build a drop toilet and a shed and, a, and everything else. Not that I'm not really skills that you necessarily need in the in this Melbourne suburbia too much, unless you're building a chicken shed. No, that's exactly right. But I didn't do it alone. There was a bunch of people got around me and the, I got around and the group of us created something that something of significance. I don't remember how many thousands of young adults we were impacting each year, but over those 20 odd years, we certainly impacted tens of thousands of lives. What do you think was the biggest, I guess, and earliest realization that you had found your calling? Probably when I walked in, this is a funny one, probably when I walked into the Independent Schools Association conference in October 1994, and I had a khaki shirt on, I looked like a, a National Parks guy, and had a Stetson hat on, and I walked up to the first booth that I saw at that independent schools conference and I looked over a counter it was the first one I saw and I said to a lady on the other side of the counter I said hi I'm Greg Smith I'm Australia's leading outdoor education specialist I think I can help you and your it was a girls school I can help you and your girls reach their potential by challenging them in the outdoors and this lady looked at me she looked at her colleague she dug her colleague in the ribs and said hey have a listen to this and she said say that again 
And I did. So at that point in time, all I had was a paddock. I had no team, no gear, no nothing. That was October. And, and this woman looked over the counter at me and she said, right, we're going to bring 40 of our senior girls to you in April next year. How much is that going to cost us? I said, I'll get back to you. And that school became my biggest client over those 20 years. They'd spend a couple of hundred grand with me every year. We looked after their entire outdoor education curriculum, if you like, from year seven to year 12. And so in that moment, when the universe saw me and this lady, lady, her name was Tony, Tony Pride, there was synergy. Something ticked and it went, it went from there. What was it about that? Because, because I know for many business owners, A, we don't really know what the hell we're doing when we start, right? We make stuff up, right? And as you did, you found a paddock, you stuck some sheds up, you walked up to the nearest person you met and said, I am the greatest. What was it about that particular thing that A, you felt that you were Australia's leading outdoor education specialist? Or gave well, you the courage to position yourself as such? It was a soul-driven intent and heart-filled desire for me to have an impact on young adults just the way that other men and women who were older than me had had that impact on me. What I wanted to do was I was lucky enough to have a normal, in inverted commas, loving, supportive, middle-class, white male background, and I knew that I had the resources behind me one way or another, to use my time on the planet to actually make an impact, um, make a difference. Yeah. And look, that's so cool. I think, I certainly think that as entrepreneurs, we're all driven by that, mm-hmm. that desire. Well, we all want to create an impact in some way on the yep. world around us. Whether, whether our dreams and ambitions might be just for you and your family or whether they have a greater, more broader community or global impact. Yeah. We all have that in common, I think, as entrepreneurs, don't we? Yeah. And for many years, family at least, uh, would label me as the missionary man. I was always on a mission. I was wa- always wanting to make a contribution to something that was bigger than me. Why do you think you have that drive? Where does that come from? Uh, it's a gift. It just, it's there. Some people know that they want to be a dancer. Some people know that they want to be a taxi driver. At that point in time, for this young adult and the formation experiences that had been part of my education, I just knew that that's, I was the right person in the right place at the right time to have a go and the universe heard it and agreed. Okay. Let's roll forward to 2012. You, I don't know, approach Outward Bound or they approached you? Yeah. So ultimately I did sell the business to Outward Bound. And at the time, having been in business for nearly 20 years, when I started looking, the environment, the context of being in that space, you got to think back to the global financial crisis and the fact that in Australia, our systems are becoming Americanized, particularly our legal system. I was continually under threat of litigation. And at the time, I was one of the very few companies, or we're a proprietary limited company, but one of the very few companies in Australia that were privately owned. Most outdoor education outfits are either owned by a school, the scouts, the guides, Outward Bound, as it turns out, and other not-for-profits that had resources behind them that when things were to go wrong, and in the outdoors things often go wrong because it's an unpredictable space, there were mechanisms that would protect the people that were making the decisions. So insurance policies and accountants, etc., etc. I got to a point where psychologically the continued undercurrent of being, in Greg's words, now being picked on by crazy parents and school teachers and people that were looking for ways to complain, it became a little bit unbearable. So what landed on my pillow each night was responsibility. And for 20 years, I took that responsibility and ran with it. But I could feel myself bending a little bit under that pressure. And in the industry, there'd been a few deaths during the early 20, so that was in the early 2000s. And I didn't want to be lying on my pillow with the weight of a serious injury or death. I was looking to spread that risk for me while still being able to contribute to what I think is one of the most important educational processes and systems that we've got available to us, particularly here in Australia. So I went looking, had a conversation with a few of the bigger bigger operators over a couple of years. Outward Bound came to the surface. They were looking to expand their operation into northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland. And eventually we did a deal. Yeah. Now that deal was a vendor finance. We just did it again. What did you learn from that? 
from the vendor finance situation. Because uh, I knew you were in, in the business for another five years post sale as a yeah. as a vendor finance. Yeah. Let's split that into two. Firstly, would you do a vendor finance again? Uh, so by vendor finance, if, if for those listeners who are not familiar with it, the, the rather than the buyer going to a bank or finding finance from someone else, they basically pay you as the owner a slight higher premium to then buy over time. Yeah, we became a vendor finance and okay. the, the bank. That's right. Okay, so would you do it again? The answer is it depends. It would depend on what that organization was, what they are up to, how aligned I was with their mission and their intentionality. If I was to be forced into a corner and my wife and I, who held that can for another 10 years, she would say, under no circumstances would we vendor finance again. For me, it would depend. Okay. What, would, what did you learn from that vendor finance process? I guess for Leah, for example, I don't know that I'd sell my business and then stick around for another two or three years and not own it and not have a sort of control or responsibility. That would be, it would feel kind of weird to me. Yeah, and it felt kind of weird to me as well at times, except that I still had a contribution to make to the industry. So I saw my way of amplifying my contribution was by Australia's oldest and good reputations outdoor education outfit that also had an international footprint. So I, I saw my expertise, my experience, what I'd learned over 20 years, um, having the opportunity to continue and to be amplified. So I, I wasn't disenchanted with the industry. I was disenchanted with the personal cost, the psychological pressure that working that industry alone was causing for me or creating for me. I think that's an important thing. It's not just the industry. It's actually having that mechanism to deal with that pressure that it puts on us. I think we all do that, right? Yeah. We're in, we're both in marketing now. There is a great deal of pressure and responsibility yeah. for doing lead gen and lead management for a client's business. Yep. Yeah? You, their, their future depends on you. I disagree. Their future depends on them. Yeah. And so if I play on this concept of responsibility, it is all of our responsibilities for those of us that are in business to put something of value into the market, get the message out about what it is that we're doing and make the sales that are required to put food on the table and allow that impact to grow. It's not up to us as marketers to sell, well, this is our take. The take that the Buntu team have, we will get people to the front gate. You need to get them rushing down the driveway and crashing through the front door and sell your own TV. It's not our job to make the sale for you. It is our job to create the interest, help you build the relationships and get the attention that you deserve. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. You take a year off, a year and a half off, give or take, during which time you decide what you're going to do when you grow up. And yeah. you arrive at doing some marketing and what was what is now the, the, the genesis of Ubuntu, and it's called Conversion Wizard. Right? Now, that one ultimately doesn't succeed because of a, a disagreement with your business. I don't know, maybe a values misalignment. Well, Tell me about that, because often we, we go into businesses. I mean, my first business, I had six business partners. Right. Thankfully, most of them were reasonably silent and, and didn't really get involved in the day-to-day operations too much. But business partner often has pros and cons, Right. right. Pros are you can share workload and share skill sets. Cons are, which you're about to share with us, what do you see as the cons? Why didn't conversion wizard work? It didn't work because it turned out, and I didn't know at the time, but it turned out that the Australian gentleman that I went into, in inverted commas, partnership with was a misogynist, clearly narcissistic, crazy guy who suckered me in and knew more than me at the time about marketing and ended up once I was in too deep to really extricate myself, caused this family all sorts of headaches. What I learned about him over time, we to this day do not know whether he is dead or alive because he was chased down living in the Philippines by the locals, having ripped off the local, not only the local community and his team there, but also cross swords with the constabulary, et cetera, et cetera. And he's wandered off into the sunset when I don't know where he is. Indeed, yeah. he's still alive. So... Yeah, but what happened was that he taught me a bunch of things and out of conversion wizard, when I'd left, it came something new. What I'd learnt as I left Outward Bound was that 
that organization are very, very good at getting educational outcomes. They employ phenomenal young adults. They train them to within an inch of their teeth. They provide wonderful quality gear. They've got excellent governance systems. Everything about that organization, I remain enamored by. But they got one thing wrong. And it's the one thing that caused their undoing and led ultimately to that business not existing anymore. Not in this part of the world. Outward Bound still exists. And good on them. I love what they're up to. But in 2020, they metaphorically shot my baby in the back of the head and it died. A nasty little death. So what they got wrong was the customer experience piece. So remember, I'd been at this for 20 years and had built a series of relationships where Greg knew at my clients, my clients' wives and kids and family. And I ended up going to clients' 60th birthday parties and other celebrations. So this was an extension of my family, which is typical of a high eye on the disc profile. So that was a double-edged sword because when I sold the business to Outward Bound, they didn't get the depth of relationships that had been created. So they made governance decisions that made my clients cranky. They would do things like put prices up exponentially and then not really properly negotiate that and would announce that to a client rather than work it through with them because they had a governance structure that needed to be financially supported. I didn't. I was working in the business. I didn't have a team of half a dozen people sitting in that office making things happen who needed to be paid at reasonable Aussie wages. So they didn't get it. I didn't get it at the point of sale, just how, not sensitive, but just how reliant that business was on good human-to-human -human relationships. So, in my opinion, the bit they got wrong was the customer experience piece. And at the time, what I got for myself as a consumer was that I was really bored. You walk down to the airport here at the Gold Coast, and at one end of the tarmac, there's A320, and it's got a Jetstar insignia on it. Have a look at your ticket. There's passenger. You get treated like a member of the bovine community as you use that service. And thank goodness, we get transported by that company safely most of the time. But the customer experience that we have is pretty damn ordinary. Go to the other end of the tarmac and there's an A320 parked there. Same machinery, but it's got a Singapore Airlines insignia on it. You get treated like royalty. Cup of tea before takeoff or a beer before takeoff, a hot cloth, friendly smile. Your ticket says guest, not passenger. A whole bunch of differences. So the question that came, that, that came up for me was, what are the best tools that we have given all of the human relationships that we've nurtured over the years? What's the best thing at the moment that I can come up with or use to help my clients Velcro their existing customers to whatever? It is that they do. So I created a consultancy called the Masters of Client Retention. That actually led on to the conversion wizard because people started saying, well, that's great, Greg. I know how to fail clients, hear me. But what about client acquisition? <clears throat> then what came to the surface was handwritten, wax sealed mail, cleverly designed with a data team around that so that we knew that the, the addresses and the phone numbers and the emails and the LinkedIn URLs were all there to back the mail process. So call team member, data team, the whole system came together and worked really well. In the first six months of this, I made an accountant in Brisbane, 1.4 million bucks out of two months work. So mm -hmm. data cards and calls, clever creative. Show up in the quietest channel to market, which is the physical mailbox, was the concept. And it worked. Get to the middle of 2022. COVID, floods, fires, Ukraine, interest rates, staffing, supply chain. When you can get staff, there's nowhere to accommodate them. Drama, drama, drama. Turn on the news and choose your poison. So this team asked ourselves a question. And the question was, what's going on in the marketplace at the moment for us as a team to be the same, but for us now starting to get complaints and niggles and things didn't feel right. So we asked ourselves, what's changed? And here's what had changed. We got it intuitively when we stopped for long enough to reflect on this that the marketplace was anxious. Then I went looking for evidence that it wasn't just Greg and a thought bubble. And what we got was that, yes, the trust in our trust on the planet now in 2024 is at an all time low ebb. The marketplace remains anxious and the marketplace is made up of human beings. So what's the antidote to anxiousness was the question that we asked. And the answer to the antidote to anxiousness is you and me. 
team and beings working together to have the impact that they want to have and doing their best to support each other. Hence, the brand Ubuntu was born. Ubuntu means people. It's a derivative of that South African word, which I used during all of those years working outdoors. I've even got little packs of cards that we used to use with the kids called the word Ubuntu means Tim. I see you. I recognize you. I appreciate the fact that we're chatting to each other. I think we had, you know, certainly during COVID, the government message. If you want to be conspiracy serious and say COVID didn't exist, I will challenge you to think that maybe all the governments in the world suddenly agreeing on one thing for the first time in human history was probably a greater conspiracy theory in itself. But let's assume for a moment that COVID exists you know, to, to appease the conspiracy theorists and everyone else with two, two broken cells to rub together and go... The message that came out from just about every health authority in the world was stay apart from each other, right? Now, you didn't stay apart from your significant other. You still slept in the same bed. You, know, you still hugged the children as they went off to school when they were going to school. You still saw your family members as long as they were within in Melbourne, that five-kilometre bubble. bubble. Right? You're still caught up with your close friends. Now, what was the difference between those people and everybody else who suddenly you were pushing away to 1.5 metres? And for me, that was that you had this level of trust with that person that they would wear a mask if they were sick or they would, you still brought those loved ones closer to you. You, know, you had that human con, human to human connection with these really trusted people in your world and your loved ones and your close friends. Everybody else, every time you turned on the radio or the TV, it was like, stay one and a half meters away, stay further away. I like this stuff from everybody else, which is the complete opposite of actually trying to create this human to human connection. And I think the challenge for me that I saw as business owners, Greg, and I know you did as well, is that when the the community message is stay distant from everybody, how do you actually create the connection with someone who's not yet a client, but we want them to be? Yeah, because they've got a problem that you can solve for them. Mm -hmm. So we, we are living, to your point, Tim, we're living in the most, in inverted commas, connected time in history, but loneliness is at an all-time high. It's a conundrum. What do we do with that? We're living in, it could be argued, the safest time in history. Longevity is at an all-time high, and yet... We don't feel safe. We feel anxious. So there is a conundrum at play. What I know is that, Tim, this morning, you put your jeans on one leg at a time. That's what I did too. That's what every human being on the planet does when they get out of bed. What that means is that we're human beings first and we are business people second. So at that level, there is an opportunity to actually connect with each other, to be real and authentic and fair dinkum. And if we can get past the BS of the tattoos that we put on each other's foreheads that say CEO and CFO and CTO and all of those things, like, let's get, well, I don't want to dismiss that. Like, they're important, important roles. But that's not who we are. It's what we do. Mm. So how do we make the world a better place, just like I attempted to in those 20-odd years working outdoors with young adults? How do we do that in the businesses that we're running? How do we keep our self-awareness high enough so that we can actually show up who we are as who we are to have the impact we seek with the education that we've been gifted enough to have and the financial and health resources that we've been lucky enough to have at our disposal? That's the question. Okay. So talk to me about your system. How do you apply this in your business? Getting attention is the hardest thing we do, I think, particularly as smaller businesses. If you're, if you're Coca-Cola, you can spend $4 billion a year on marketing and get as much attention as you like. You just buy it. But when you're a smaller business, you need a system that's going to interrupt the pattern of attention of, we'll call them prospects, but other busy, distracted business people so that you can get their attention for long enough to start a conversation. Metaphorically, it's like when I was 9, 10, and 11 years old, the people who knew more than me said, Greg, you should go to school dances. I went to a boys' school. So the boys would go down the local town hall. You'd line up on one side of the, the room. The girls from the local girls' school would line up on the other side of the room, and never the twain shall meet. How like That, that was a disgusting idea for an 11-year-old. Until an adult, a teacher or a parent, grabbed two wrists from each side of the room and put them together in the middle of the room and said, dance. And of course, over a lifetime, good things happened and friendships built. So for me, our system is all about starting those conversations, nurturing those relationships and creating synergy where one plus one can equal seven. So there's a few versions of the system that we've got in place and we call it the 
contemporary human to human communication ecosystem for business. Here's one version of it. The largest B2B platform on the planet is LinkedIn. There's over a billion of us on there now. So first thing to do using this part of our system is to seek a connection intelligently with somebody else on the planet that you'd like to begin that conversation with, that you might want to dance with. And don't just send a, hi, I see we're connected to some of the same people. Let's connect. Like boring for many or for 18 months or so, Tim, my connection request on LinkedIn was, hi, Tim, if you put your pants on one leg at a time, it makes you a human first, business person second. I'd love to start a conversation. If you're feeling brave, let's connect. That was it. Oh, and I'd love to support and follow your work. Now, there's a whole bunch of psychology in that because what I'm saying is we're humans first and I want to support and follow you. Once somebody's connected, thank them. Be grateful. Be appreciative. We tend not to appreciate each other in business. Send that human being something of value and nurture the conversation. That's what our system does in LinkedIn. Let's say I'm, I'm seeking a connection of 400 people a month on LinkedIn. We then go to the next step, ecosystem. And the next step is if I've got a 25% connection rate, which is, that's okay, but I can count in 10s and 25s. So I connect with 400, I seek a connection with 400 people a month, 25% of those connect. I've now got 100 people potentially to start a conversation with. My team goes through that list and they bet them for being possible people to talk with. Let's say we get that down to 57. I then have a look and we get it down to 40. I then send those 40 people something handwritten, wax sealed and invitational in the mail. Basically, I'd like to continue the conversation, Tim, because we're a new LinkedIn connection that we've just started in LinkedIn. I'd like to get on the phone. So do you think doing that, right? Actually showing that investment because obviously when you're sending a handwritten card, and I've seen the cards you, you guys do, they're awesome. Rather than just automated text message or AI voice message or easy email fractions of a send. It makes a massive difference, isn't it? Because they're actually standing out more so than everybody else, who a, is probably not doing that in the first place, but so, only out even further. That's right. But the challenge that we've got at the moment is I should start tracking this, actually. The number of pictures or we'll just call them pictures or manipulations that I get via email or LinkedIn every week, like I'm just so bored with them. It's quite obvious somebody wants just to sell me their widget and their widget might be absolutely brilliant. But if there's no relationship on which to base the conversation, I ain't buying a widget cold off an email. So you can't have the dance unless there's been a connection. So our job is to connect with those people in LinkedIn. It's to make sure that we've vetted them as best we can. My data team go and find their data. We send them something delightful in the mail. Our call team are actually on the phones attempting to begin that conversation before we send the mail. The mail lands, we're then back on the phones, nurturing the recipient to say, what did you think? Greg would simply love to have a 15 minute conversation with you and stuff happens. That's part of the ecosystem. To, to continue expanding on that, that it's going to take us more than the 10 minutes that we've got left here, but that's part of it. So it's about, so Greg's got nine rules of marketing in 2024. Show up, show up, show up. That's the first three. Nurture, 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 repeat, repeat, repeat. If in doubt, repeat steps one and two. Exactly. But what we get <laughs> so often is pitch, 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 manipulate, 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 repeat, repeat, repeat. And we're bored. We're over it. Human to human comms in business in 2024, by and, by and large, is boring. It is ubiquitous. It is bland. It's not different to anything that we were doing 10 years ago. Have a look in your mailbox and how excited you get when another window envelope appears. It's the best. Like, how exciting. Like, it, it's just the metaphor, Tim. I dare anybody, I dare anybody that's listening to go into a shopping center anywhere on this planet. Anywhere. Third world, first world, second world. I don't mind. Just go into a shopping center somewhere and point out for me what the differences are in that shopping center in terms of the way it's laid out, set out, how it looks, smells, feels, and squeaks under your feet. They are all the same. Of course, there are exceptions, but I'm going to say they are all the same. We are bored out of our brains. Walk into the jewel, though, at Singapore Airport. Holy smokes, they'd thought about that from a customer experience point of view. That's different. That's sending a message to the people that rock in there that we actually care about you and how it is that the spirit of you needs to interact 
with the spirit of who we are. Like, what an exception. I think there's a good lesson in this that I'd like listeners to take away from it. When other than the connection, depth of connection is, firstly, if we want, we want to stand out from everybody else, right? But if we want to stand out, what is the experience that I enjoy? So it's a place to start paying attention to the experiences that you have when you interact with other businesses. And I don't care whether it's your local movie cinema, whether it's the Louis Vuitton store that you walk into, whether it's your mob that clean your car or wherever you go, your supermarket, right? The dibbles groceries to your door. Have a look at the experience and go, what is it that I liked about the experience and how can I apply this to my business? And that's the key. How do you like to be nurtured is the how question. How do you like to be nurtured? Right? How do you uh, we treat it? How do you what, what makes you feel special and more connected with the businesses that are serving you? And can you do that to the business, the people that you serve from your business as well? As a secret human human connection. Let's do this, mate, because I know we uh, we're running out of time. How would your mum describe what it did you do? How would my mum describe it? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. She's eighty four today. And uh, so mum would say, Well, I don't really understand what you do, but you're working very hard. And if I was a lot younger, I would like to look after your books. She was a bookkeeper. <laughs> a very good one. So, yeah, my mum doesn't really get what we do, but she knows that it's lighting me up and that we're holding the family together and doing what I'm doing. So she's a supporter. Awesome. What's one thing about Ubuntu that you didn't expect? I didn't get it when we launched this in the middle of 2022 that our reputation is now starting to precede us and we're getting a reputation for zigging while others are zagging. So the flavor of the month is AI and automations and CRMs and all of that transactional efficiency stuff. And I am not anti that. We need it. What the Buntu boys are doing is we are keeping the balance. While everybody's zigging into that, we're saying, let's zag. Let's keep the balance. Because we've got to remember that AI and all of that stuff is not an end in itself. Yep. What makes you a great communicator? I'm clear on my intent. I want to make the world a better place for the work that I do each day as I interact with our clients and our prospects and our team and our suppliers and everybody that's in our circle of influence. You've been with your wife for 30 odd years now. How do you... Had a 40 years ago, yeah. How do you balance work life and fitness? At times, it's not balanced. I think that's a, that would be a truthful reflection. The key is communication. Surprise, given what we do. But what makes this relationship and this family tick is attempting to get the balance right. That might not be a daily balance or even a weekly balance. But over years, remember, we've known each other 40 years, is to get the balance between the quieter times, the less stressful times, and when it's all systems go, be all systems go and support each other with that so long as you keep communicating. What's one thing that really frustrates you when you look at someone else's business? From the outside looking in, it often feels like they are successful, more, more successful than I am, particularly financially, if I look at the external evidence of what they're driving, where they're living, how they're entertaining themselves, where they're going, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. That frustrates me because I know that we've got something of high value in the market and only in recent times have we started charging what we're worth. Should have got in sooner. What's one initiative that's on your whiteboard today that wasn't there 30 days ago? We've started a new membership platform. What we've learned is that with the expertise that is in this business, we don't have the capacity every day to respond to everything that's coming through the door. So we've created a little $47 a month membership that will grow. There, there'll be three, four versions of this. But the initial one that was not there 30 days ago that is called LinkedIn Next is 47 bucks a month. It's a membership. Ask us anything, anytime. There's a monthly webinar to support our members and a whole bunch of other bells and whistles to support our clients in their human-to-human -human comms in 2024. Yeah, nice, nice. Lastly, whoops, you've been doing this for a while. What do you think is one lesson or learning that you would like people to come away with after having interacted with you in some way? Be yourself, back yourself, be confident that you do have something to contribute and go get it. And if you need help, ask for it. Greg, thanks so much for jumping on the show today, sharing a lot of experience and knowledge with us and our audience. Guys, if you want to learn more about the work that Greg is doing over at Ubuntu, 
That's Ubuntu, B-U-N-T-U.com.au. And I know, Greg, you run a pretty awesome event every Wednesday night, Australian Eastern Time at 530 called the Smithsonian's. Oh, yes. I didn't name it that, but I am Greg Smith. <laughs> yeah, Smithsonian's. Ubuntu.com.au forward slash Smithsonian's. It's like the museum. Go and check that out. There's a really awesome group of people there getting together on a window as well. Greg, thanks again for joining us and sharing your your wisdom and your knowledge, man. Good on you. Thanks, Tim. What an honor. Bye for now. Guys, if you've enjoyed today's show, please like, follow, subscribe, all those cool things. Get someone else on and we'll catch you on another episode real soon. Take care. Okay.